Luke chapter 10, we're just going to take verses 17 through 22. This is the moment of the rich young ruler, and I decided this week to break this up into a couple of different sermons. Um, you know, I, I chart out how I, how I preach through a book of the Bible, and then as I preach through it, it always changes, and this is one of those moments. I decided to do a couple of maybe shorter sermons rather than one really, really long sermon, and so uh, I think this is just worth our time to break this up and, and just take this passage, even just a verse at a time today. Uh, sometimes I read the whole passage and preach on it. Sometimes I go a few verses at a time. We're just going to go one verse at a time because I, I really think what, we, what God has for us here is just so incredibly important. He's been talking about, if, if you remember our, our uh, study last week, he's been talking about who belongs into, in the kingdom of God and who doesn't. Like, that's a pretty big deal, right? Pretty important passage. Who belongs in the kingdom of God and who, who doesn't, how we know. And so this is what he says in verse 15. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Okay, that's pretty important. Let me, let me read to you the parallel passage in Matthew 18. It says it this way. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So again, there is something that we studied last, e last week. There's something about children that we need to become like them in, under, in, in order to receive the kingdom of God. We need to become more childish. And of course, there's a bad way, like <laughs> if you hear it that way, right? Oh, easy. I'm very childish. I, I should be a shoe in for the kingdom of God. Of course, he means that in, in the sense of being childish, in the sense of being helplessly dependent upon grace. That is how we enter in to the uh, eternal kingdom that Jesus is preaching about. Are you helplessly dependent upon his grace? That's how, that's the frame of mind we should be in, in order to be a citizen of God's kingdom. And so let's, let's, let's talk about how we think through that. How do I know if I'm, if I'm having this childlike faith that Jesus is preaching about? Well, think of, think of it in these terms. In your mind, when you think about your citizenship in God's kingdom, and, and when you think about its legitimacy, is it legitimate because of you and your performance? Or is it legitimate because of who God is? Like when you look for proof, this is proof, this is, this is hard proof that I know I am a part of God's kingdom. Do you make an argument based on your performance like the disciples have been doing here in Mark recently? I'm the greatest disciple. No, I'm the greatest disciple. I'm, I'm doing better than you are, so I'm especially a part of the kingdom of God. Remember how the disciples would argue about their, their performance and they would jockey for position in the kingdom of God, right? Are you like that? Or do you think about who God is? And is that what brings you, uh, in your mind, legitimacy, legitimacy in, uh, in your, your place in the kingdom? Or do you, you know, do you, do you think about the circles that you worship in? Do you think you are a legitimate citizen of God because of the de denomination you may be a part of or the, or the circles of Christians that you associate yourself with? Or, well, this, this is the real deal and I'm a part of this group. You know, the disciples would do that too, right? They would witness other people casting out demons in the name of Jesus and they would say, no, you can't do that. You, you don't get to be legit like we're legit. You know, you don't get to do that. Is that, is that how you think of your citizenship? Or do you receive the kingdom of God as a child? Again, helplessly dependent upon his grace. Nothing in, I, in my hand I bring, as that hymn always says. And so may, I think many of us, when we read about those knuckleheads, the disciples, it's pretty obvious why well, I don't act like that. We do it, we're, we're much more clever in how we think, all right? We, we, we're, we do this in much more subtle ways. We, we add a yow but. You know, we, we learn the lingo, we apply it to the way we think, and then we add a yow but. Yeah, I, I know I'm dependent upon the grace of God, of course, uh, and I need to be like a, a, a child. But I still need to meet him halfway, right? I mean, maybe not even right in the middle. I still got to meet him halfway somewhere in there, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to get a few attaboys. <laughs> you know, I know, I know that I need his mercy, obviously, but I think that my resume is going to get me at least enough attaboys to make it easier to show me mercy and so therefore I feel better about my place in the kingdom of heaven is that if that's if that's the way you think if you absolutely insist on including your merit 
that you have to add to the grace of God, which would no longer make it grace, but if you have to add your merit to the merit of, of Christ alone, then today's passage is a warning to you. If you absolutely insist, and I, and I think we all absolutely insist on trying to add our merit. We, that's our default mode. We, we need the Bible to correct this way of thinking in us, and we need to keep going back to the Bible to continuously correct this way of thinking. This is a, this is a warning to us. If, if you absolutely insist on, on including your merit in your salvation, then consider the rich young ruler who doesn't want to receive the kingdom of God like a child. He wants to receive the kingdom of God based on what he can do. Let's, let's see how that goes today. We're starting at verse 17 in Mark chapter 10, and it's entitled The Rich Young Man, actually, and we'll talk about why it's called The Rich Young Ruler here in just a second. Let's just read verse 17. Like I said, today we're just going to go one, one verse at a time. So, and, he, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's the question, right? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is known as the rich young ruler probably in your mind. If you grew up going to Sunday school and you hear about this story and you, you've heard it preached on before, the rich young ruler is what comes to mind, not the rich young man. Well, this moment is in the Gospel of Mark. It also exists in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's also in the Gospel of Luke. And so you hear me say this all the time. When you're studying a moment in one of the Gospels, it's, it's very advantageous to see if it exists in the other three Gospels because if you put them all together, you get the most amount of details possible to understand what's going on in that text. So in, in Mark's Gospel and Matthew's and Luke, we know that this guy is rich because he's described later on as one that has great possessions. He has a lot of stuff. He has wealth. So he is known as rich in all three Gospels. Now when you study in Mark's Gospel, he's just a rich man, okay? Uh, but in, in Matthew's Gospel, he's a rich young man. And so Matthew refers to him as young, gives us that additional detail. And when you read in Luke's account, he just is described as the ruler, and so you put them all together, you got the rich, young ruler. We got all these details in this. He could have been a ruler of the local synagogue. He could have been possibly a member of the Sanhedrin, which would have been a ruling body amongst the Jews. And so this guy had authority on some level. So think about this for a moment. This guy is everything we men aspire to be and can never quite get a, a grasp on all three at the same time. He's, he's young. He's wealthy, and he's powerful. He's all three of those things. He's, he's everything we want to be, right? And I got to hand it to him. Evidently, he's humble in addition to this. Did you notice his posture in that first verse? When this rich young ruler came to meet Jesus, he ran up to him. He was excited to see Jesus. And he knelt before him. He has a good intent. He's displaying a posture of extreme humility. This is much different than like the scribes and the Pharisees who go after Jesus, seek him out, try to argue with him or, or, or cause him to have a bad day. This guy is exhibiting extreme humility. He's, he's rich, he's young, he's powerful, and he's humble. Wow, that's a, it, rarely do you see all of those qualities coming together in one human being, but this guy seems to be pulling it off. And did you notice how he addressed Jesus respectfully? It goes beyond respectfully. He addresses Jesus in the most respectful, uh, flattering way he possibly could. He says, good teacher. Now to you and I, now we lose something here in translation, right? This wasn't written in English. We know this. And it wasn't written in our time and in our culture. And so we got to consider all these things to fully get everything that's in that address. Good teacher. If, if you and I describe a teacher as good, oh, they're a good teacher. At best, we mean they're an amazing teacher. They do a really good job at what they do. At worst, when we describe someone as a good teacher, we're saying they're, they're above average. They're a good teacher, right? So, I mean, it can mean a lot of things to describe someone as a, as a good teacher. But in this time and in this culture and the, the specific word he's using here, 
good teacher, it is black and white. It's like saying perfect teacher. Teacher without flaw. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Good teacher, what must I do? He is, he is flattering Jesus with, with as much esteem as he could possibly muster up. Perfect teacher. And so that's why Jesus, here in what we'll, what, we'll, what we'll see in the very next verse, he doesn't even answer his question before he recognizes how this man just addressed him. And he does that for a specific reason. Let's look at verse 18. It says, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. See how the definition of that word makes a lot more sense to us now. That's, that's where we see it in our English language. Why do you call me good? Right? Because that, that word, it, again, it means more than just above average. It means more than pretty amazing. It means perfect. Why do you call me perfect? Everybody knows only God is perfect. Why would you address me in that way? Now, you and I know we got a lot of uh, we have a luxury of being outside this moment and, and having read through the New Testament and know the Christian belief system, right? We know that Jesus certainly is perfect. He is without sin, right? And so this isn't Jesus admitting that he is sinful, right? There's no possible way that at this moment in time that this rich young ruler can come out of nowhere and understand the the uh, Christological stance <laughs> of Jesus in this moment, right? He, he de- there's no way we can expect him to understand this in this moment. Jesus is laying out a foundational truth to reframe his question before he gives an answer. Why do you call me good? No one's good but God, but God alone. There's, there's a common belief we have here. Before I answer your question, there's a common belief we hold. God is perfect. God is perfectly righteous. With that as the foundational truth, let's examine your question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? See how that reframes it? What must I do to inherit eternal life before a perfectly righteous judge or God? Because we know his justice is perfect and it's absolute and he is without error. What must I do to be deemed acceptable by one who is perfect? What can I do before one who is perfectly just and I am not? There's the question you should be asking yourself right now, right? Because we're in the same situation. We will all stand. We live our lives before this perfectly just judge right now. But we will all stand before God on the judgment seat and be judged. What are you counting on in that moment? What is it about you that you know you're going to be a part of this eternal kingdom? What is it about you and how you live? What are you going to point to in your life to convince that which is perfection that you are acceptable? We should all reflect on that question if we really and truly want to understand the sequence of events that's happening here in Mark. Jesus gives him the answer that he believes to be true. He, he says, you got to be good. Let's read verse 19. Look at this. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Jesus is saying, okay, you got to be good. You know God is perfect, right? Of course you know God is perfect, so when you stand before him, you must be perfect also. You must, to be acceptable by this just judge, you got to be good as he is good. And so Jesus goes right to the, the latter portion of the Ten Commandments here. And he starts naming them off. You want to be righteous? Be righteous like this. You know, be obedient. Be righteous in order to be accepted by him who is perfectly righteous. This makes sense, right? It makes perfect sense. And it falls right in line with what that rich young ruler wants to believe. And here, let's read verse 20. It says, and he said to him, teacher... All these I have kept from my youth. I I think that that is a response you and I really need to think about when we think of salvation. Because I think the vast majority of churchgoers right now across the planet Earth are thinking exactly what that rich young ruler is thinking in this moment. What do I gotta do? You gotta be good. Oh, I've been good. 
I've been good forever. I'm pretty good. Like when I'm looking around the world, I'm thinking I'm, I got, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. You know, when I consider the, the Ten Commandments, don't murder. Well, I haven't killed anybody yet. Check, you know, don't commit adultery. All right, you know, I'm doing pretty well. Don't lie. I'm as honest as they come. I'm known as an honest person. Don't steal. Why would I steal? I'm rich. I don't need to steal anything. I have great possessions. I don't need to defraud. I don't, I don't have any desire to covet because if I want something, I just go get it. I'm self-sufficient. This is how I've always been, li- li- I've always lived as a Jew. That's how this, this man is posturing himself. As long as I can remember, yeah, I've got the Ten Commandments memorized. I've got them on lockdown, which is much more than many of us can say right now, right? Try to rattle off the Ten Commandments off the top of your head. Uh, See if you can even do that, let alone live up to them. This man lives with the same self-ignorance that you and I are prone to live in. We think that we're pretty good, but why do we think that? Why would we ever think that we're doing pretty well? I mean, this is the most basic truth that we learn in the entire Bible. You get like just a few paragraphs, just a few chapters into the Bible, starting in Genesis, and you immediately learn that man is sinful and fallen, and that we're living under this curse. You, You learn that right out the gate whenever you're reading in the Bible. And then if you keep reading, you see that mankind gets way more sinful as time goes on. And we, we, we come up with new creative ways to be sinful all the time. This, this basic truth is something that we're so prone to glaze over and convince ourselves in many ways that, you know what, I think I'm doing all right. I think if I stand before God, I'm doing okay. But why would we think that? Why would we, how could we possibly live with that lack of self-awareness to think that we are good enough to inherit eternal life? Well, there's three easy steps. If you're having a hard time uh, leaning on your own merit, here's the three easy steps to being able to convince yourself that you are good enough on your own merit to get into heaven. Step number one, never compare yourself to God. Don't ever do that, all right? If you want to be able to use your own merit in order to get into heaven, don't ever compare yourself to God. He's perfect. You're never going to win that comparison, right? We tend to compare ourselves to other people all the time. And there's some people that we compare our lives to and we start to feel bad about ourselves. Well, if you compare yourself to God, prepare to feel super bad. He's perfect. He is literally the standard for righteousness and so if you want to live with a lack of, of self-awareness don't go comparing yourself to God right or if you compare yourself to God uh, you're, you're gonna have a lot of awareness of how sinful you truly are so another thing here if, if you want to be ignorant um, of your sinfulness always compare yourself to someone you deem to be a little bit behind where you are and we're great at doing this or it's, it's, it's really easy, right, to, to identify that speck of dust in someone's eye and ignore the, the log in our own eye. But when it comes to feeling good about yourself and, and coming to the conclusion that you are good, you can always find someone behind you or someone you deem to be behind you in order to feel great. Like, if you want to feel good about who you are, watch Dateline. You can always find somebody on there that makes you feel awesome about yourself. Like you're killing it in the life department. Pun intended. <laughs> Dateline. I was watching Dateline last week, and, uh, and this guy took out, it's, it's, it's the stereotypical moment, right? The guy takes out like million dollar life insurance policies on his wife and then says, hey, let's take a trip to the Grand Canyon. This will be fun. Uh, stand there on the edge. He throws his wife into the Grand Canyon and then collects on his insurance. And I'm thinking, man, you know, on my worst day as a husband, I'm way better than that, dude. <laughs> you know, I'm doing, I am, I am, I feel so much better about myself. Like, there are times in my life in which I feel like, oh, man, I just can't, like, accomplish anything right now. I'm frustrated. I've been short with my wife. I've, I've had a short fuse with my kids this week. I'm not I'm being a good dad. But then I watch Dateline and think, yeah, I'm doing pretty good doing pretty good you know I don't have a million bucks but I haven't thrown my wife off the cliff so all in all I'm doing pretty well but you know even if I did throw Amanda off a cliff there would still be somebody worse than me wouldn't there 
I mean, if I threw Amanda off a cliff and I got caught and my kids are now orphans and I'm in jail, I, there's still somebody out there worse than me. And when I get into prison and meet everyone and introduce myself and what did you do? <laughs> oh, man, that's way worse than me. You know, I just threw my wife off a cliff. But like, what? you killed like three or four people. You know, I'm no Ted Bundy, right? That's, what we, that's where we would go. If we can, and, and you know what? Even if I'm Ted Bundy and I'm sitting in jail, there's still somebody worse. You can find somebody that killed more people than he did. And I, well, I'm no Adolf Hitler, right? I didn't try to wipe out an entire people group. I'm doing okay. I don't know where Adolf Hitler goes. We'd have to do some more research in history. I know, like, we could probably study Nero. Nero's pretty messed up, and he'd probably be worse. But, it, you know, you get the point. No matter how bad you are, no matter how stupid you are, no matter how evil you are, you can find somebody more evil, you can find somebody dumber, and you can make yourself feel better. If you play the comparison game, you'll always rig it to where you win. That's what we do. And so if you insist on using your merit to stand before God and, and, and be acceptable, you, that's how you got to do it. you got to rig the comparison game, and then that will work for you. And you'll lack the self-awareness that you should have as a believer who reads Scripture. Now, Jesus in this moment, man, he could put the hammer down on this guy, right? Have you studied the Sermon on the Mount? Of course you have. You go to the Journey Church where we spent like six months in the Sermon on the Mount. This guy has, like, he evidently missed that sermon series by Jesus. He missed this whole Sermon on the Mount. Because Jesus literally, just so clearly, oh, murder? You, you've heard it said, don't murder. But I say that everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to judgment. If you even insult your brother, you're liable to hell. <clears throat> oh, I insult my brothers all the time. I love you guys, but I'm falling broken and I insult you sometimes. It's just the way we are. Adultery? You've heard it say don't commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Ugh, that's, our, that's our least favorite verse in the whole Sermon on the Mount right there. You just can't get, can't get through the Sermon on the Mount unscathed. Jesus could just destroy this guy in this moment. Of course, it's in the Sermon on the Mount that he says, therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus just said it that bluntly. Be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be good like that. And being perfect, you know, he, he's, he's going to perfectly judge. You will be perfectly judged. He sees right through all the external and to the internal. Because even when we are, you know, pulling it off in the good works category, even if we are having a pretty good week and we've, we've done everything expected of us and we've maybe gone above and beyond, even when you are firing on all cylinders in the good department, are your motives even all good? What about if you critique those? See, God, he sees right through everything that we do. We can fool others. I'm a pastor, man. I'm in a, I'm in a position where I can fool people like crazy. They just assume the pastor, right, is holier than thou, right? But I, I promise you, I say it all the time, if you could look in here, you bring a flashlight. It's dark, right? I'm falling and broken just like you are. I know what's in the heart. Jesus tells me, Mark chapter 7, what comes out of a man is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So, I mean, clearly this rich young ruler, he hasn't tuned in to the, to the Sermon on the Mount because he had the audacity to come up to Jesus and say, I have followed all the rules. I have followed all the rules. I must be a shoe-in. I mean, you would think, again, this guy's so wrong. He's so wrong. What is Jesus going to do in this moment? Should he turn up the volume and just start throwing it in his face? Let's see what he does. He sure has uh, the, the right to do so. But let's look at verse 21. I'm just going to read the first half of it. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Isn't that amazing? Isn't, isn't that perhaps the most captivating passage out of the entire paragraph? This, we know how wrong this guy is. He's so wrong it's not even funny, but Jesus looked at him and he loved him. What a relief it is 
to know that this is our Savior. This is, who, this is the heart of Christ. He looks, he looks at us in our ignorance. He looks at us when we lack all this self-awareness. And he still manages to love us. He's so gracious. I, I will say, though, this, this still does speak to this man's humility, does it not? Because there are times in which people come up to Jesus and say things, and they're super wrong, and Jesus just lets them have it. Man, he, he, he'll, he'll go tit for tat. I mean, he will really go after somebody if they are super wrong or blasphemous or something like that. But this man, he is sincere. He's clearly sincere in his belief that he could possibly do something to be loved by a perfectly just judge. And, and I think his humility, I think his humility played a role in, in Jesus' response to him. You know, if we're, if we're humble before God, we don't have it all figured out. If we come to him, even in our ignorance, he, he loves us. Jesus responds to him with love, and, and he does the loving thing. He tells him the one thing he does lack. He's honest with him. He sees straight through this man's exterior, identifies the one thing he lacks, identifies that, that place in his heart where he's, he's hiding, and people on the outside can't see, but Jesus can see. And he, and he says something about it. Let's, let's continue. And, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And said to him, you lack one thing, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now, I don't believe that this is a blanket statement, a general statement that we're all supposed to sell all our stuff and be nomads and wander around the earth and proclaiming the gospel. It, there are some that are that do that, maybe they're called to do that like this man was. And I, I, but I think Jesus identified like an idol in this guy's heart. Like he identified what this man's allegiance really was to, how much he loved his possessions and his wealth and how much more he valued those things than he did God. And Jesus just went in there and just touched the nerve. We remember also in the Sermon on the Mount, no one can serve two masters, Jesus says. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Remember, Jesus said that as well. He's, he's pointing out to this man, like, look, if you, if you really want to get in on your own merit, okay, looking at your heart, you need to sell every possession that you have. Give it to the poor, and then come follow me. If you want to get in on your own merit, let's start there. I mean, Jesus did teach, right, right, just in the previous paragraph, in the pre previous chapter, like, do whatever you got to do to cut sin out of your life. If that money is making you sin, get rid of it. If your hand's making you sin, if your foot's making you sin, if your eye's causing you sin, gouge it out, chop it off. So he's just, he's following that logical teaching. Man, your vice is wealth. Your vice is wealth. And so, so Jesus is calling him out. You know, this man claimed to follow the commandments, the latter half, what about the first commandment? Don't have any other gods before me. How's he doing on the first commandment? Not very well, right? And this man declined. Jesus challenged him and the man declined. Look at verse 22. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That word disheartened, like, that, that really doesn't emphasize enough what that word means in the Greek. It, it has a shock factor. Like this man he was disheartened in the sense that he almost gasped. <gasps> like, that's, I treasure that more than anything. My treasure. No, not anything but that. He gasped. He was disheartened. He was just like, oh, man, you could ask anything of me. I, I probably would have done it. But, like, you, you pick the one thing that truly is the one thing that I, I, just, I have to hold on to. Again, like, Jesus just peered into his heart. He took an inventory, and he saw immediately what this guy couldn't deliver on. And I think when you and I are really honest about it, if we truly want to gain from this passage what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to imprint upon our hearts, is that when you and I think about this, if we were in that position and we were the rich young ruler and we came up to Jesus and asked the same question, what about my merit? What do I got to do? What can I do to inherit eternal life? I think there is something embarrassingly terrifying about this moment, is there not? How would you do? If Jesus was standing before you and he peered through your heart and got past all the fraudulent stuff 
and saw what was in your soul, what would the one thing be that you lacked? Well, I'd have to say, take your pick, Jesus. I lack a lot of things when it comes to getting in your kingdom and standing before you, the perfectly just judge. Wow, what can I do to inherit eternal life? I don't think I could deliver any more than the rich young ruler, and I don't think you can either. No matter how much you think of yourself, no matter how good you have convinced yourself that you are, do you think you can stand before God and deliver on something like this? Jesus would look right through all of that. He would say, here, give up this. And you wouldn't be able to do it either. Man, what, what grace it is that the moment right before this moment, we got that teaching about being a child. What, what grace. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are helplessly dependent upon me. Oh, you, you don't think you're helpless? Let me tell you about the rich young ruler. Now do you believe you're helpless? You should. You would walk away disheartened. And so we have this gospel that we can run to Jesus. He is our provider. He saves us from our brokenness and all the ways that we can't deliver. He has delivered us through his perfect life, his sinlessness. It's imputed to us through faith. His blood on the cross atoned for every single sin in my life. When I stand before God, I am helplessly dependent upon that truth. I'm not going to bring anything before God. I'm not going to bring my baptism before him and say, well, did you see this? I'm not going to bring, you know, walking the old lady across the street, volunteer hours, anything like that. Like, how pathetic would that be to actually put before God and say, now do you like me? He's perfect. He's perfectly righteous. I've fallen so short of that, it's a joke to think I could bring something before him. And yet, in my, in, in, even in my ignorance, he gives us this passage to teach us, hey, I, I love you, I love you, but you're going to need my merit to be a part of this kingdom. What grace that is. He provides what we need to be accepted by him. That is the gospel message that we come back to each and every week. We're going to study more about this passage. Rich Young Ruler Part 2 next week when we come to celebrate. So let's pray and we'll get into a time of communion. Lord, again, we thank you so much for your grace. Lord, it's, it's embarrassing when we think about all the times we've tried to convince ourselves we're good enough and how tactically, strategically, how we manage to do that, it's embarrassing. By being overly judgmental, that's how we can do that. By, by being arrogant, by being prideful, that's how we can think we can get in on our own merit. Lord, we're so fallen and broken. Like, Lord, it's just so gracious that you love us in this way, that you would share with us these moments of other people like us who are so wrong, it's not even funny. But Lord, that you would come and live the perfect life and give us your righteousness, even though? Lord, that you would shed your blood on the cross for our mistakes, our error? It, it's so loving, it's so gracious, it's so merciful, Lord. We're so thankful for who you are. Lord, help us to reflect upon that this morning in a time of communion and be nourished by that in our souls. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.